This meeting is Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2TCC webinar series. Today we have Dr. Tomas Bokar, and we also have Dr. Ilya Panarov, both of which are associated with the Czech Technological University in Prague, but Thomas Bokar is also um, associated with the University of Southampton. Today we'll have two talks. One is an overview of the 2D research in the Advanced Materials Group, and the other is a new reactive force field for molybdenum disulfide by Dr. Ilya Panarov. Dr. Polkar, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure uh, to share our results here. So we decided to split, uh, split our talk, in fact, in two parts. First, I will cover kind of overview, uh, why we study uh, 2D materials and what is the need for that and what results we have both in theory and in experiments. And then Ilya will, uh, will, will provide kind of like 15 minutes specific lecture on uh, force field development for molybdenum disulfide. So um, most of the work actually uh, was done in Prague and Prague is a really beautiful city in the middle of uh, Europe. So uh, if you don't have any, any, any chance so far, so, or you try to see it again, uh, you, are, uh, you are welcome for sure. So uh, my group is quite large and uh, we deal with number of activities. Uh, I will discuss here mostly nanoscale tribology and this is related with solid lubricant coatings. So these are two areas which I will a little bit cover, uh, cover today. Um, so to start with solid lubricants, um, there is really many candidates uh, for solid lubrication. So it's polymer uh, materials, Teflon, uh, you can uh, you can you can find lot of lot of others, but for let's say heavy duty applications with relatively high stresses contact loads, you cannot use those polymeric materials easily, and uh, you have to look for other solid lubricants. And uh, graphite, of course, is used for uh, for many uh, many years, and um, the same applies for molybdenum disulfide. So both of them, as you know well, they have very peculiar structure with very low. Uh, very low, um, just one of us bonding between the sheets, so they really allow very easy, easy sliding. The idea, really, what to do with these coatings, uh, with these materials, was not that clear for many years because we can produce them as a bulk, as a, in crystalline material, but uh, they really struggle. Uh, if you use just graphite, you will realize that this is excellent material for humid air, but it's not really working very well in vacuum and molybdenum disulfide, for example, is opposite case. It works very well in as a crystal. It works very well in vacuum, but in, in, in the air, it's very easily to be uh, damaged and oxidized and so on. So we need to look for better solution basically and how to use them. And that's uh, how I started basically research. So there are two problems though. If you look uh, for uh, 2D materials, which are really absolutely fantastic because this is very well defined system. If you look for tribology, you look for every single atom, you understand the role, and the material is just surface. Typically, we don't care much about the bulk effect, any things like grain boundary, plasticity. So it's kind of like minor issue here. And the, the, the inter, uh, chemical interaction are very limited. If you use these materials in real application, let's say like bearing, um, then of course you need to do much thicker materials and then sliding is extremely complex and there is a tribochemistry, oxidation, large scale deformation. So it's very, very difficult to really understand the problem. But I hope that I will convince you that there is a, one specific case where we can really just go from this very large scale coating issue, tribology, very complex one, to, to simplify it to 2D problem and then perhaps return back and optimize the coating again. So. Um, this is how we started, or how I started with the material. So uh, these are uh, these are cross sections from transition from microscopic cross sections of uh, sputtered films, which contain both uh, molybdenum disulfide, or in this case, for example, molybdenum diselenide or tungsten disulfide, which is all very similar, uh, very similar materials with similar structure and sliding properties. And what you can see here that if you sputter them as a thick film and you look into detail, you see that sometimes you produce these 2D materials. They grow basically during the uh, during the deposition of the coating, which we still don't, don't understand how it's basically happened, uh, but it's quite interesting. So you have carbon metrics, for example, here you have 68 percent atomic percent of carbon, which is the matrix. And here inside you are able to kind of grow uh, by this very complicated process as sputtering is uh, these 2D materials inside. And, um, and this is the coating which we built, uh, we produce 
about a one micron thick, and then we can use it in tribology. We basically do sliding experiments. And that's what we did. And we observed quite interesting feature. So you have this complex material, as you can see here, which is carbon combined with, um, in this case, for example, uh, molybdenum diselenide. But after sliding, if you look to the sliding interface, this is where you really slide your counterpart. And you do detail of this point, you will realize that it is almost pure molybdenum diselenide. As you can see here, for example, this is like depth profile using uh, Auger or in this case, I think XPS. And you can see that at the surface, there is no oxygen, no oxidation, which is quite interesting itself and no carbon as well. So there is some specific effect when you separate the solid lubricant phase and you make it very nicely ordered there. And then we try it in humid air, we try it in nitrogen, different environment. We always end up with the same conclusion. We produce this very interesting uh, solid lubricant crystalline transitional metal dicacogenide on the surface. And um, you may say perhaps this is because we have initially this kind of like platelets, which looks like 2D platelets in the material. So they may be kind of separate mechanically. But actually, it's not the case because if um, if you look what happened with fully amorphous initial material, so we can produce this material by sputtering amorphous, we can combine them with chromium, with nitrogen, it's very robust. Always when you slide them, you will end up with beautiful uh, ordered layers. And if you really do details, that's what you see really on the top. You see, for example, in this case, tungsten disulfide, or in this case, molybdenum disulfide layer. And this produces low friction, and indeed these coatings are extremely useful because they can reduce friction to level which is typical for oils for example so it's very robust and uh, but what i showed so far i showed that we produce this tribal layer but i we should prove basically uh, that this tribal layer uh, represent low friction material and we did it very recently um, where we uh, look for this vertex. This is basically when you slide macroscopic ball over this one micron thick coating, you produce some kind of wear path. And if you look inside, what, and you use atomic for microscopy as, a, as your tribological testing, so you can really check what is inside and you find areas like that. And after further analysis, we find out that it's recrystallized tungsten disulfide layers. You see, this is basically 2D layers, uh, one over top other and these are very low friction if it is not there if you are on some other material the friction is way way higher so we can produce the corresponding frictional map and realize for example uh, what coverage of this uh, vert track is um, by this low friction phase and then we can do macroscopic models uh, to understand to understand the problem so um so we can conclude here that if I slide macroscopically these very complex coatings containing, for example, molybdenum and sulfur, um, I will end up with almost ideal 2D material. And it looks like this. So this is the surface. And if I really do detail of some of these parts, this is what I will get. You see, this is almost ideal material. There are almost no defects, in fact, or very few. Um, so this very stochastic random nature of sliding results in production of ultra thin crystalline layer which is extremely, uh, this is low friction material. So, and if, so I have two questions now uh, to, to, to answer. One, how this can happen? Why this material uh, formed this triple layer from almost anything we prepare? We got always the same thing. We got always this, uh, this triple layer. This is the first question. And second question, of course, if this is my sliding interface, uh, I can ignore all what is above and below, and I can just study this sliding of these materials, which simplify extremely my problem, because this I can now access by molecular dynamics or initio by basically uh, nanoscale uh, simulations. So, so I have now the way how to really go back to these 2D materials, and this is what I will uh, start to describe a little bit in detail now. So my first question was, um, or uh, how really we can form this uh, tribal layer, which from amorphous, somehow we get very nice crystalline. So we started with pure molybdenum disulfide. That's a relatively simple model, although it's not very simple to do it in reality. And we slide, uh, you see that we have two crystalline layers and some amorphous in between, and we slide them 
uh, in simulation, we did several coating densities and several testing parameters like different temperatures. And always what we end up uh, was a very nice crystallization, relatively fast crystallization of the of the material. So, and this is this is the experiment when you have amorphous material with molybdenum disulfide, we slide it, and this is what happened on the surface. And uh, our simulation shows something similar. I would be a little bit careful here uh, to say that it's one to one because of course uh, you see that we have only three layers here we have really relatively thick material and the condition we had to use in order to to, to kind of stimulate a little bit the model were quite extreme extremely high load and extremely high temperature but actually we and uh, when i say we it was mostly paolo and nicolini which was my uh, in that time, my postdoc developed quite nice way to look what more we can get from the from the simulation, and he used basically um, traditional Avrami equation, which basically uh, shows um, the progress of crystallization, um, where this y basically is ratio of volume of crystalline phase divided by volume. So for fully amorphous, of course, uh, you will get zero. For fully crystalline, you will get one. And this Avrami Abraham equation use basically two key parameters here, and this is nucleation rate and growth rate uh, and time, of course. For nucleation rate, uh, we can calculate it, but we don't have all parameters. Some of them we can obtain via molecular dynamics directly, like melting temperature or melting enthalpy. Uh, some of them we don't know and we cannot get. And then there is a growth rate. And again, we can obtain from molecular dynamics anything, we, everything we need. So, what we can do, take this equation and just do very nice, very uh, just to do fitting to get these uh, three parameters. And that's what we got. And um, as you can see in our temperature range, it works very nice from 3,500 3, Kelvin up to about 6,000. And once we have the parameters, we can look what would happen if we decrease the temperature, which we cannot do in our MD simulation because it would take then seconds to, to compute, which is of course impossible. And that's what we did. And um, so we can extrapolate to lower temperatures. And typical sliding temperature, if you slide microscopic aluminum disulfide uh, under certain contact load and so on, is about 900, 1000 Kelvin, which seems quite high. But if you really imagine that you have some aspirated contacts, this is typically what you get. And our simulations say that about half of material will crystallize in certain volume in a matter of seconds or um, uh, or, or let's say up to one minute. And this is actually what we observe experimentally. And as well, another indirect proof is that at 300 Kelvin, uh, amorphous material will never crystallize uh, like molybdenum disulfide. And this is what we know from experiment as well, because the time is almost infinite here. And then you can use this model, not for sliding, but to explain basically that the major thing here is diffusion. So it's a really the most important thing that we add energy into the system in terms of uh, thermal energy through sliding. So it's not actually some shear or, uh, or movement. Um, it's actually the, the thermal input. And we can then look for other thermal inputs, like for example, here where they use laser to uh, crystallize uh, amorphous molybdenum disulfide or actually TEM observation. Um, because if you use TEM, of course, you can crystallize amorphous molybdenum disulfide. And we, we, we could see that we can really predict the energy you need uh, you need to crystallize uh, from our model. So we are very satisfied with that. So this was first step to understand this formation of the crystalline molybdenum disulfide as a result of sliding. And our conclusion is, is mostly a process uh, driven by diffusion and therefore uh, temperature energy input. So once we have that, of course, we can do, uh, we can do more things. Uh, we can play with molybdenum disulfide. Um, we can produce amorphous materials and slide it. We can produce crystalline materials and slide it. You can see the sliding of amorphous material. Then we have sliding of combination, for example, of amorphous. We can measure friction there. Uh, the problem we, here we have that, of course, we are limited by good force field, which is a huge issue, of course, for molecular dynamics in general, and especially for this problem in, in particular. So, and that's something which Ilya uh, will uh, will discuss uh, will discuss uh, today. But uh, even with some, let's say, uh, non-perfect uh, force field, we can get some interesting information about, for example, super lubricity of commensurate molybdenum disulfide, when we showed that uh, we can get 
extremely low friction even for commensurate molybdenum disulfide uh, without rotation only when uh, the the sliding uh, sliding uh, direction is out of the zero or 60 degrees of molybdenum disulfide as you can see here and um, or we can add some water in between which again uh, it's a little bit difficult because of force fields, but and we can observe the effect, for example, of these contaminants on, on molybdenum disulfide. Um, so we can do a lot of stuff now with uh, with our model, of course, provided we develop better uh, force fields uh, for our uh, combination of materials. So this was molecular dynamics, but uh, in our group we deal a lot with uh, what I would call bottom-up approach, looking for up initio, and um, the, the, the key question is, if we have different combination of materials, could be molybdenum disulfide graphene or graphene graphene. So what is the lowest friction? And uh, the first thing, how we try to address that, or first step, was um, my collaboration. Uh, the work was done mostly by Giacomo Levita and, and, and Clelia Righi in, from, uh, from Modena and now Bologna, uh, is to look for uh, potential energy we construct a potential energy surface for graphene. I think we were first in that time to uh, one of the first to, to really do it for friction. And then uh, once we construct that, um, we just try to, to, to derive, let's say, not friction, but shear strength. So this is something what I would call ideal friction or let's say static friction, because we can, we can really compare materials and we say which one is more likely to move when I apply the force. They cannot really get friction or coefficient of friction from the simulation. Of course, you can say that this is the case when we have commensurate surface, like graphene to graphene commensurate one. Uh, what about to rotate them and get much lower friction? And indeed, we did that, which you can imagine that computationally is not easy task because then your cell gets really big. Uh, so we did a couple of tricks to, um, to use it. So we selected specific angles. And we calculate again potential energy surface and you see that you can get very complicated shapes of course instead of this commensurate one uh, what you perhaps cannot see that uh, you cannot see the numbers these numbers are extremely small here so and it's what you expect that basically friction of incommensurate uh, surfaces will be much lower than the commensurate one so uh, this is one way how to how to approach the, the, the problem from up initio. Another one was developed um, by Antonio Camarata, who is now uh, as well um, in audience. And um, he looked for vibrational frequencies of the distortion modes and tried to identify those which may be related to friction and friction dissipation, of course, because we speak about dissipation of energy. And what he did that basically he kind of uh, successfully individuate uh, those uh, vibrational frequencies which may be related to, to friction. And, um, and then uh, it, it allows him to, to, look for, uh, to look for perhaps even nanoscale design of new materials. Because if you say that there is some modes which uh, influence the friction, either positively to decreasing or negatively to, to increase the, the, the friction force, we can perhaps design the material to control them and, um, and produce a material with even lower friction than standard graphene or molybdenum disulfide, for example. So he, he proposed titanium, for example, and, and calculated. Uh, this is just example here because uh, we published papers some times after that, showing that very likely there is no such compound like molybdenum, titanium, sulfur at normal condition. But as a, as a concept, I think it's, it's very interesting, very interesting work. So, and, uh, and then finally, uh, to add, but I will not spend much time here on that, is up initio, uh, we combine this up initio because we have potential energy surface with standard Brandt Tomlinson model or statistical thermodynamics to understand really nanoscale friction, uh, nanoscale friction of purely crystalline materials. And I have to say as well, in this case, ideal materials, no defects and so on. We can discuss it, uh, we can discuss it later. So this is all simulation, but we need to look for experiments and how to measure genuinely 2D friction. And this is experimental part of, of our work. So uh, one interesting concept was published by Lee et al in uh, about like five years ago. Uh, what they did that they took the, took the flake, they kind of like weld uh, silicon carbide, or it was just silicon uh, 
kind of tube or very thin tube and then just drag it and by the by the deflection of this kind of very thin material uh, you are able to calculate the forces basically but it's interesting and there are some advantages in the concept but there are many disadvantages for example you are not able to really control the direction uh, you are not able to control to control any movement of the flake and rotational because you see that you are not you are you do some momentum for sure here and as well you don't know absolutely what is the what is the load basically of the flake so it's not perhaps it's interesting but not a good concept really to get good numbers but you can use atomic form microscope but the problem is that how to put flake on the top you can try to sputter very thin two three nanometers layer and then crystallize it uh, we tried that i would say it's very difficult to do it because it's difficult to analyze what you actually end up on the on this tip you can try to take 2d flake and transfer to the tip but it's very difficult either because um uh, because it's not very easy because the the sharp tip they have like 10 20 nanometers diameter so it's not easy to to do it so our solution was very different and we just decided let's use afm and just to push the flake so basically you can see we can we can really load it here and push it or we can drag it so we can really touch it here and because friction or um, adhesion between the, the the tip and flake is probably higher than the, the flake and the other material we can drag it and then we can load it as well so we develop that and uh, we look if what what friction we can get and it seems that we end up with one of the lowest ever measured uh, first how to prepare the material so it was work of my postdoc all these uh, Meng Zhao Liao and he did uh, he did fantastic job. So first he developed the method and improved the method of water assisted peeling. So which allows him to produce various uh, heterostructures rotated uh, with really well-defined angles. And once you have that, uh, he was able to provide uh, these systems where, where you have heterostructures with graphite and molybdenum disulfide or hexagonal boronitride or with, uh, with molybdenum disulfide or other combination graphene and boronitride so um and you can even select to some extent rotation especially for these two because they are uh, they have very high lattice uh, mismatch so they are basically naturally incommensurate so i will focus on this this work of molybdenum disulfide graphite and what we did was really to use our slider and we just push the push the flake um as you can see here we started here we were pushing the flake and you see this is it end up here and we can measure the force so this is when you slide before you hit the flake now i hit the flake of course force goes up and now i'm pushing the flake so this difference actually is force which is genuine force of the flake and this is beautiful here because you see that this flake is moving on graphite there is no other material um, and i can directly measure the force the only load here, of course, is uh, is adhesion force here, which is quite high, of course, for this type of materials. So this is how we measure basically the, the kind of what I call genuine friction. And um, this is one way how to do this. Another way, as I said, we can we can load this flake here and drag it. And if you do that, you measure, you can increase the load and get a coefficient of friction. Um, that's what we get and what we had let me hide this uh, what we got was friction which, which was one millionth uh, one of, i think the lowest ever measured and we were pretty excited by that because it was two orders of magnitude lower than any other report we could find uh, find before and um, of course we coupled with simulation and there were two reasons why we did the simulation one of the reasons that we need some information about adhesion uh, which experimental is very difficult to get. So we calculate basically the adhesion between the flake and substrate, and this we, we use to calculate to calculate the friction here. So this is how to get the lowest friction. And um, but there is another thing we find out, which is as well exciting, because we we develop quite a nice way how to split two effect of friction because if you have flake which is like this nice triangular flake of molybdenum disulfide sitting on graphene you have basically two key effects here one which is really what we call plane friction which is from the area basically area versus area and then of course you have something which is very different and these are the edges so what we did that we divided basically friction into two parts one we call um, area which is basically um, 
which is which depends on area and other which is uh, edge which depends on perimeter which is this size and what you can see here that when we look for sheath rank of molybdenum disulfide here uh, you see that it goes um, um, it goes down with the with the with the flake area and then if you look for edge pinning strength is almost um, almost the same regardless of how big the the domain is so basically what we find here that um, for molybdenum disulfide the edge uh, pinning effect but it actually it's negative here uh, the edge pinning effect is very strong so the friction here is close to zero so all friction we measured is because of the edges and uh, when we look for graphene uh, we got opposite thing uh, the the graphene if you look graphene on graphene so um, we just we have the edge pinning strength which increased with the domain uh, domain parameter. So basically, uh, this was um, so this was dominated by the edges, the graphene sliding, and not by the area in between. So just to conclude here very quickly, um, for molybdenum disulfide, uh, we find out that the edge uh, edge effect is relatively small. Um, and most of the friction originates really from the area one. For the graphene, we find the opposite way, uh, so that edge, uh, edge pinning uh, strength was very, very high. And important thing that in this case, because it's incommensurate, it doesn't matter. You can rotate the flake and change the direction of the movement. We tried that, and there is no dependence on sliding direction as well. So, um, so this is this is the experiment which we did, uh, which we did. Uh, which we did and now we try go back and to relate these experiments with more macro scale experiments which i just described at, uh, at macro scale so this is all uh, from my side i try to cover uh, co cover a lot of things but we still have a lot of gaps and this is nice roman bridge in portugal and you see that uh, initially everything looks like nice road but then you end up with a lot of gaps but hopefully we are now in situation that with some help we can bridge the gap and continue in our way to uh, to develop uh, solid lubricant materials. So I really thank you for your attention, and um, and uh, I will give now a place to Ilya to continue with his uh, force field development. Thank you. Stop sharing, yeah. So, Ilya. Yep. Uh, just a moment. So, yeah, as was mentioned before, well, force fields are really necessary. Again, MOS2 and TNDs in general are very interesting and not only for tribological coatings. There are some other applications and they are quite frequently, uh, they quite, quite frequently require that, well, either, well, either that you crystallize MOS2 in a special way or, well, you want to get some insights and how it actually gets crystallized. So naturally you need simulations with like thousands of atoms for at least nanoseconds, which is not really feasible with ab initio methods. And you need, it, you need those simulations to be chemically accurate. So natural choices reacts FF. There are actually several uh, reacts parameter sets available. Uh, some of them were used to study crystallization of MOS2. Uh, how, uh, well, however, when I got to that, well, we tried to do something that no one actually did successfully that I know of to crystallize something more than one layer of MOS2. So simply, simply like two layers. And what we get from the state-of-the-art force fields is not really satisfying. Some one of one of those produces a completely wrong uh, crystalline phase. Another produces something that very much resembles the correct result. 
Uh, however, it's not really the thing that is necessary. Another one produces a more structure. And again, uh, given experimental uh, and previous simulations, we would expect the MOVIS 2 to actually crystallize in a very constrained environment. So we figured there is no really satisfying reacts of F parameterization. Uh, well, luckily I was doing completely another project and it went wrong in the right way. So I was doing vanadium to oxygen parameter development, testing it in different ways and somehow happened to notice that for one of them, there are nice VO2 layers that very much resemble MOS2 layers. Uh, not that it's supposed to happen in vanadium oxygen system, but again, nice thing to try to turn it into molybdenum to sulfur parameter set. Uh, it was originally relatively successful after I managed to merge the parameters in a way that they work. And actually also got some insights in why the state of the art uh, parameter sets were not doing exactly the right things. Uh, they all happened to heavily favor the rock salt MOS structure that is not known in real life and is not stable within DFT. However, the very first force field that I made was not really the right one, it was producing layered structures, but those were the wrong layered structures. Uh, the point is MOS2 can form layers of different, well, atomic arrangement. Uh, and one of them is metastable in real life, though it can be stabilized. Another one is stable. And in DFT, there is also a notable difference. So 2HMOS2 is a stable phase and 1TMOS2 is higher in energy. However, this first, uh, well, first attempt on REACTS was actually given the opposite. And this is why 1T, the octahedral one, was crystallizing in simulations. So more development needed, but at least we are on the right track. So basically, the, like the, the very basic setup. Well, I have some parameters, I have some training set, I do Monte Carlo light optimization runs. And after each run, I expand my training set by some structures, uh, well, generated within Reacts and computed and computed in DFT uh, to, well, basically learn from the mistakes of the new force field. Uh, the Monte Carlo run setup, well, heavily inspired by several publications, is uh, relatively straightforward. I randomly change uh, some of the parameters that I think should be changed, uh, compute the error for the new parameter set, accept the step if it makes things better, maybe accept the step if it doesn't make things too much worse. And well, I don't want to, and I don't want to run infinitely. So at some point, I just terminate the run. Uh, so after doing some of those circles, I actually started to have uh, uh, really good things, really good things. So first in this convex hull diagram, you can see that the red line, my new force field uh, is very, is in very good correspondence with the, the results I computed within DFT, while again, all the state of the art force fields are basically doing the same mistake of favoring uh, rock salt type MOS. However, uh, it's, uh, it sort of explains why the, those force fields were actually uh, crystallizing the right MOS2 in a single layer setup because, well, in a single layer, if you try to crystallize rock salt, you will naturally end up with sulfur atoms on, on the outside and molybdenum in, in the middle. So you get something that is very similar to MOS2 layer. However, well, in our new force field, we are within where we are very close to DFT and there is no overly stable rock salt type MOS anymore. 
So cell parameters of a MOS2 was another test. And uh, again, we are within reason from both experiment and computations within PFT. Uh, some defective structures and adhesion of layers was also, at least within the margin of error that one would expect from DFT, from the DFT values. Uh, I also did uh, some of the, uh, some of more weird tests. I mean, energies of uh, amorphous molybdenum disulfide uh, models were generated via melt quench within uh, REACTS and then optimized with DFT. So I can get energy in DFT, I can get energy in REACTS. I plot them versus one another. Uh, I get a slope that is not exactly one, but is close enough to one. So I run crystallization simulations in this relatively constrained two-layer setup, and I get the right uh, 2H MOS2 layers, uh, though they are well, a little bit rotated from the origin, from the well expected uh, setup. And well, again, comparing to the state of the art force fields that were not producing the most two layers at all, it's pretty uh, notable progress. So, another simulation where, where I'm trying really hard to crystallize something. Well, a box, uh, again, I'm a I'm, uh, box with atoms, I'm heating it to 5000 Kelvin to basically randomize the structure pull it to 2000 Kelvin, and then I kind of mimic tribological conditions by, uh, well, compressing and expanding the cell, sort of mimicking the, well, uh, applying normal load and releasing normal load after the, after the ball has passed the, the location. So the outcomes, again, new force field, uh, proper MO, uh, to HMOS2. Uh, other force fields form either this rock salt sodium chloride uh, type MOS or uh, amorphous structures, well, with some uh, resemblance of uh, rock salt MOS. Uh, so going further and not really trying to crystallize MOS2, just running basically a melt quench simulation with a little bit of cold at 2000 Kelvin. So again, box dimensions tailored to make layers properly in plane like here on the, on the right picture. Density of crystalline MOS2, yeah, pulling at 12. In terms of simulations, relatively slowly, 10 kelvins per picosecond. Of course, in real life, it's very hard to achieve. Uh, so the outcomes, again, uh, state-of-the-art force fields either produce the wrong crystals or just produce uh, amorphous structures. Mining force field uh, produces uh, layered MOS2. So we have the very nice, uh, so finally we have the very nice MOS force field. So for future plans, of course, we want to go to more practically relevant compositions, which would require adding number of elements. Yeah, and yeah, of course, it's never, it's never a bad idea to refine the force field. So yeah, on the right, you, you can see some of the preliminary simulations for molybdenum disulfide with oxygen. You can see forming of the most two layers on the, on the surface. So I would like to thank those who gave money and those who provided uh, computational resources. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you both. I do see that we do have some questions that have already come through in the chat box. We'll call on Audrey Van Doon, please. Go ahead. 
Um, thank you, Thomas and Ilya. These are great uh, for the great presentations. Just in general, so is this concept of sliding a 2D material to improve its quality, is that something that can be uh, somewhat universally applied? So I think one of the big challenges synthetically is to make a high quality, relatively defect-free material. Is this something that if, if you control your synthesis conditions that you can generally apply to improve the quality of, uh, of, of synthesized materials? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I never thought about that, to be honest. Uh, but uh, thinking about that now, that uh, of course, there are so many ways now how to prepare, for example, molten disulfide, that it's, um, it's very likely not applicable to all preparation methods. But I can imagine, for example, if you do sulfurization of very thin molybdenum layer, because there's mm -hmm. one method, for example, you can sputter a very thin layer of molybdenum, and then uh, basically you sulfurize it to get molybdenum disulfide. Um, I can imagine that um, if you slide these materials, uh, like 2D materials, in, and, uh, and then you have quite a defect, of course, in this process, uh, you can perhaps rearrange a little bit or get some in, if it is sulfur atmosphere, uh, you may get, you, you may kind of fill in some, uh, some, some defects, uh, possibly, but whether this is really um, feasible, that's is another question. Yeah, I would say that at the moment, very likely not, because um, the the defects you have very often you do polycrystalline materials, and then sure. once you have this, you cannot do anything. I think about that. Sure, sure, sure. So as long as your defects, yeah, you have to have the right defects yeah. to be. If able you have to local, exactly. Time. If you have like you know, uh, let's say missing sulfur atom, like the yep. vacancy here, then then it's possible. Yeah, for any anything larger, very likely not. Uh, so what I can add, of course, I'm not that big of an expert, but uh, from what I've read, uh, for tribological applications, uh, the question of defects and crystallinity is not as critical, but for like materials for electronics, it is very essential. Mm -hmm. And for applications like catalysis, it is sometimes desirable to have specific defects. Sure. Yeah, what I didn't show that, but we are trying to uh, understand now, of course, that uh, the, the results with AFM I showed were really on extremely uh, ideal and pure defect-free materials as we can get, uh, of course. Uh, so, but uh, we are really now studying as well the effect when we know specific defects and we can identify it by AFM, we try now to understand the effect of this single defect and try to both experimentally and in simulation space. It's not easy, but mm -hmm. that's what we try to do right now. But true is that um, in tribology, anything like uh, flake sliding, uh, very likely we need to account for defect-free uh, of really defective materials. Yeah. But uh, from engineering perspective, if you get friction, which is like, um, I don't know, thousand times higher than the one we measured on ideal materials, it's still absolutely great result. So we have quite a room uh, there to uh, to play with materials which are not perfect yep. in tribology, of course, not in other applications. Um, hello, Ilya. I have a couple of uh, technical question uh, for your forces development. Uh, one of, one is uh, about the models that you show us in slide three and slide four. Are there bilayer? Did you consider any vacuum along the Z, Z direction, or or they are just bulk structure? Uh, again, I probably forgot to specify it, but uh, in some cases there was a uh, wonder. Uh, well, Leonard Jones wall along the Z direction. Uh, the last model that I was showing there, it was just a bulk structure. Okay, because I, surpri I, I was surprised that normally in our course of development, uh, MOS, we also consider bilayer structure during the training. That's why I just consider, I just wonder, is that bilayer or bulk, uh, especially in slide three and slide four? That's why I am asking. In case of bilayer, it was a bilayer. So okay, okay. There's so, a sandwich between the Leonard Jones ball. Oh, I see. Another question is that, uh, what data set, what type of data set uh, did you consider to fix the issue that you observe in MOS or XFF? Uh, well, is there any particular data set that you consider to fix the issue 
uh, that you observed during the crystallization. Uh, Osta Osta Hussein results in uh, sodium chloride, sodium chloride uh, type structure. But I, I just especially wonder what, what, what sort of data set did you consider to fix that issue, yeah. Uh, so uh, for uh, point one, I was actually using uh, the different starting point, basically that force field that I was lucky to stumble upon that was producing layers from the very beginning and that mm -hmm. we didn't have this problem with the crystallizing rock salt type MOS from the very beginning. Uh, oh. Secondly, well, I was using a number of crystalline structures. Uh, not all of them were real crystals. Some of them were hypothetical structures like uh, yeah, this rock salt type. I also was using uh, models that I generated via melt flange in Riyadh. Mm -hmm. and then optimize in DFT. Mm, I so I, it, uh, it, is, uh, it takes some effort to, well, to melt quench actually an amorphous model because the system really has a lot of drag to, crystal to crystallization, but once you do it, it provides a lot of useful information for post -dating. Okay, I see, thanks.